Hello and welcome to episode 9. Today for the review I've chosen a book called Immortality by Czech writer Milan Kundera. Uh this book was published in the year 1988 originally in French and its English translation was done by Peter Cassie and it was released in 1991. To tell you a bit about the writer Milan Kundera, he is a Czech but uh he felt really stifled in Czechoslovakia and when it became clear to him that he could not reform the communism in uh, Czechoslovakia he decided to move to Paris so this was in mid 1970s and uh, he moved to Paris and subsequently his Czech citizenship was revoked and after a few years he gained uh, French citizenship by naturalization so why i'm telling you this is because uh, when he wrote this book he was quite settled in the free society of France and as opposed to his previous writings wherein he operated from a really oppressive setup with limited freedom of oppression so this is a book very different in uh, this regard and uh, Milan Kundera prefers his work to be classified as french literature now to talk about the book immortality it is written in a very unusual style uh, it is basically it has uh, two stories that are intertwined with each other and they center around the themes of death and immortality so the book is divided into seven parts and the narrative oscillates between the two stories so the first story is really wonderful and it has a really unforgettable protagonist so uh, like milan kundera relates uh, in the book uh, this uh, uh, character sprang from the gesture of a woman he encountered in a health club in paris so what he did was he once uh, spotted a woman down from his window beside the swimming pool and uh, this woman an aging woman of over 60 she made a really graceful uh, wave of the hand uh, to her swimming instructor and she did it so effortlessly and so beautifully that the memory of this uh, gesture remained etched in the mind of the writer and through this gesture he conceived of this protagonist who he calls agnes and he assigned this gesture to her now agnes is a beautiful woman who um, lives in paris along with her husband paul who's a lawyer they have a grown up daughter bridget and she also has a sister laura who is very different from her in personality now agnes is dealing uh, with she's struggling against the memories of her dead father and she's at a point in life where she you know she is yearning to be alone so she has this silent wish of moving to switzerland where she is originally from and uh, she also wants to remain in contact with bridget and paul and to talk about laura like i said she's very different from agnes but uh, you know she's she's different in that that she's more physical than mental and this is not depicted as uh, you know laura being any less than agnes it is simply shown as if uh, laura is you know laura is uh, more comfortable with her body she understands the language of her body as opposed to agnes who who is almost disgusted by the body who is you know constantly having a mind affair with herself so laura is a sister who constantly imitates uh, agnes but in her imitation she is also seeking to correct agnes so through uh, agnes she imbibes this hand waving gesture and she adopts this gesture and later the gesture is also embodied by paul and this is how this uh, gesture of hand waving this becomes immortal and whether this immortality of this gesture is something good or bad is left for the writer to decide uh parallel to this story runs the story of the famous german writer goethe and his uh, devotee bettina now bettina was the daughter of a woman goethe uh, you know admired when he was young and she is passionately in love with the writer and she chases him and she stalks him she sends him a barrage of letters and uh, you know to his dismay because he he does not see her as a love interest but rather as a threat and he does not respond very lovingly to her letters but uh, uh, nonetheless bettina keeps writing to him and what she does is after goethe passes away she uh, you know uh, uh, tries to get back all the letters and she amends her replies and the original letters she doctors them and tampers with them and she makes it sound like goethe was in love with her and uh, then she subsequently publishes a book publishes a book called the correspondence of a uh, child with goethe and this is how she becomes part of the legend of the writer and his legacy and this is how she impacts his image and his immortality and she becomes immortal herself she renders it a taste different from what the original had been 
So uh, like this through the interwoven stories uh, that span different periods of time and through these through the layering of these uh, several characters the book seeks to explore, uh, explore the concept of death and immortality how a person uh, you know wishes to transcend himself and his present and become someone memorable so to quote an example both Bettina and Laura uh, you know they seek to transcend themselves and become somebody who is worth remembering while Bettina, you know, longs for a bigger immortality in the sense that she wants to become a part of history. She she detests the everyday and her, uh, you know, petty reality. So she wants to, you know, appear larger than life after she dies. Uh, Laura, on the other hand, aims at a smaller immortality. She only wants to be remembered by her inner circle when she is no more. Uh, in the second part of the book, uh, the image of Goethe is conjured, wherein he's, uh, you know, shown strolling alongside Ernest Hemingway and uh, they discuss about the reasons of their being famous, whether it is to do with the books they've produced of, or with them uh, or with their personalities. So this idea you know, appears elsewhere in the book as well, wherein uh, Milan Kundera is lambasting the media for you know, showing more interest in the artist's personal life than in the art that they produce. So like this, Milan Kundera is highlighting you know, the fact that immortality may not always be a nice thing. He classifies mortality also as, you know, a ridiculous mortality wherein, you know, a person uh, is remembered by posterity but not in a nice way. For example, a person who meets with an awkward kind of death or, you know, who is remembered, uh, uh, something funny about the person is remembered by the people of coming generation. So nobody wants to be remembered like that. So at the close of their conversation, Goethe remarks to Ernest Hemingway that immortality is nothing but an eternal trial. There's another very interesting uh, chapter called Imageology in which the immortality of the imageologist is explored. Now, who is the imageologist? He's a person who is a builder of images. He's a creator of ideals and non-ideals and fads, things that remain for a short period of time and then are forgotten and newer events and newer things emerge. But nonetheless, they impact our psyche, they impact our behavior and our actions. So uh, the decisions that we make regarding, you know, the person we are going to vote or what we are going to buy are all dependent on what the imageologist proclaims as the it thing. So this does ring a bell with me. I believe that we are at a point in time where we all acknowledge, we've come to acknowledge that media has a master and there is this invisible puppeteer that is running the show. But although we are aware of uh, this puppeteer being there, still it, media does have the power to impact our behaviors and our actions. And Milan Kundera, he argues in the book that, you know, uh, this imageology is something which is beyond reality, which is greater than reality. This is why it has the power of cornering us. So like this, the book raises a number of uh, existential questions. One in particular haunts me till date, which is to do with, you know, how to live in a world you disagree with. So if I talk about myself, uh, for me, poetry is my re uh, rebellion. and. Uh, you know, I'd like to believe that the verses that I pen are immortal and that their immortality is stronger than the symbols of these imageologists and it is going to last longer. But I do agree with Milan Kundera. I agree with the fact that, you know, life is all about questions and never-ending questions. And the resolution of these questions is not always possible. And it's even uninteresting to look for resolutions all the time. So to conclude my review, I would like to say that uh, intertwined with these stories, uh, you know, there is a lot of philosophy running into a lot of pages, but this book is not didactic. Um, so if you like a book which is very poetically written, which, uh, you know, makes you think uh, about a lot of things, also a book in which the protagonist is unforgettable, then you must pick this book. As far as I am concerned, I believe that uh, this is one book which has been unputdownable for me and you know, I can never outgrow this one. So do share your feedback on this review with me and signing off, Kitika Kohli Amla at The Dispatch.